Yeah. Uh, may I request you to start the session, please? Yeah. Just one. Okay. Um, good evening. Welcome for to this. Um, what is the seventh talk? The theme I want to address in this particular talk is science, democracy, and Marxism. But before we come to that, like we have been doing for the previous um, six talks, I'll just very quickly go through some of the questions you have raised uh, in the earlier sessions and try and very briefly address them and where it connects to this particular um, theme today. I will again make that connection. Uh, there are very many interesting questions, of course, and um, I think I've covered almost all of them I have here. Um, there was uh, one question, I mean, which came from the last two sessions, I mean, connected to both the sessions, which is uh, the question of how to understand people's beliefs and the idea of pseudoscience. So we know that in the context of, um, you know, science movements or the privilege given to science in India, there has been a lot said about pseudoscience and pseudoscience has often been associated with things like you know, astrology, religion in many cases, and so on. And part of it um, arises from this um, constitutional duty and the related ideas of, um, you know, scientific temper as helping us to protect against blind beliefs and superstition. And even today, these are very important problems in the discourse of um, science in India. And uh, uh, if you really look at how science in the public domain is validated or legitimized. It is also deeply dependent on this idea of uh, superstitious beliefs and blind beliefs. So how do we, I think the question here is, how do we really uh, make sense of this? I mean, in some sense, you have to make a distinction between saying certain things are wrong, obviously wrong, and, uh, and certain things are, um, you know, ambiguous dependent on people's beliefs and so on. So one of the ways in which we have to under distinguish these kind of social beliefs are that some beliefs arise due to the existential condition of being human, in particular, the conditions of vulnerability and death. And this kind of uh, conceptual uh, underpinning for what is for human experience cannot be directly transferred into some naive idea of scientific reasoning. And this is why I want to refocus this point on the naive ideas of scientific reasoning, not on the idea of reason or rational or even scientific reason. If you understand, as we have seen on the previous lectures, if you understand the complexity of the scientific process, then there is enough scope to accommodate different kinds of rigor different kinds of expectations on what you would want to call as truth and knowledge. Okay, there is, we know that we can do that. But in the Indian case, and I, that actually uh, comes back to something I will be talking about in this um, session today, we will see how, um, you know, this problem of what is it to deal scientifically with people's ideas, um, how it needs a rethink of the richness of the practices of science. And there are many things in today's uh, sessions which will actually uh, speak to it and we can come back to it to clarify some points later on there is. There is also a question of how to change the hierarchy of disciplines approach, social change can do many things, change in society. What is it that we need to change the hierarchy of disciplines? Yeah, this is a very tough question in the sense that, you know, uh, how are disciplines formed? How are disciplines sustained? Why do we have the kind of disciplines that we have? are all, um, you know, have to be studied very carefully rather than, you know, to see why is it that we tend to develop certain kinds of disciplines. If we were a, a country which had autonomous decision making capacity to create discipline, so that we create disciplines and other countries follow, then, you know, this, you can understand how to engage the question of hierarchy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the aspects of social movements and social change. But in India, as we well know, disciplines are borrowed just like our content is borrowed so we borrow whatever disciplines become very popular we borrow 
disciplines which are funded by national and international agencies and so on so you know the whole sociology of what kind of disciplines get established what don't is um, very much a part of how we are institutional setups in universities and institutions which uh, start research institutions start in india how what kind of preoccupations they have we have i think a disproportionate amount compared to the fact that uh, compared to humanities uh, institutes for example you have quite a bit on strategic studies is a lot of interest in it growth there that support from different uh, constituencies of the society so you know i think this needs re education largely i mean and it needs for a, uh, it needs a complete rethinking at the ground level um, you know on how we should understand the importance of disciplines for for uh, propagating civilizational values like i spoke about in the science education um, discussion another important fact about science teaching was pointed out by another person who said that you know science teaching dehumanizes students there is a dehumanizing effect from science teaching that is possible and therefore it impacts on the kind of people we produce now i i want to take this in, the, in a you know, when people should look at it as oh science is not creating monsters in that sense that's you know that is obviously not true and i don't think that's what the person who's asking the question is saying uh, i think what he or uh, she is pointing out is that that there is a kind of a dissociation from human values in the teaching of science and i think that's a very fair comment and that is why the fact that you can look at science as so called facts or state of affairs or some kind of statements about uh, nature Uh, which is completely divorced from human practice human uh, thought processes uh, social conditions of who is doing the thinking how science is produced in societies and so on uh, does tend to have a dehumanizing effect in the sense not only always in the negative sense but also in the in the question of distancing so perhaps this is a good uh, now that we are in covid times it's a good uh, use of the word social distancing the science education is socially distanced you know because there is nothing about the social present in what you teach in science and uh, that has that definitely has repercussions and how we are going to make sense of it is something um we need to think about people think maybe social science students and humanities students can sort of engage with it i don't know i know that humanities students for example are far more vibrant in class they are far more sensitive to the varieties of questions including questions of social justice their own privilege etc all the time classes in which i have sat or all the time people are bringing in complex questions fighting with each other etc and uh, it's very different from how uh, how a science classroom is so definitely uh, again without putting a negative value on dehumanizing there is a distancing between um, you know science learning and the world in which we live um part of it is also related the next question is it that the education system is discouraging asking questions i don't know i mean yes maybe at the school level uh, i don't you know there are various kinds of implications on it you know some many times students who don't necessarily i mean they don't have to ask questions in class alone uh, it's a process of thinking the question is what do your content as well as your pedagogy uh, help in making them think about something and even if they don't ask questions it's okay at least within themselves what does it mean to think you know that's why all the courses i do workshops i do for children in philosophy is all about thinking reading writing that's it i don't i don't know anything else in the name of philosophy because it's about the way and even for phd students they just do this thinking thing and i find it's very useful because it allows you a way to understand what we mean by questions how questions arise etc and uh, there was a question about whether content in science education is influenced by ideology very uh, the answer is an obvious yes um and there is another pro- the question which was about science and english and science education and um, uh, this person shares his experience of teaching in the nicer and says that students who had not good in english not competent in english were left out of the larger stream of learning science and maybe becoming scientists and so on and this is a serious problem in india and is there a problem about language per se with the context of science i would say the answer is no in fact as we all know well particularly in the uh, from the early 20th century onwards uh, enormously creative work in the sciences uh, particularly in physics chemistry biology and so on uh, came from europe and 
in many of these countries including germany france and russia for example uh, the language of instruction was german french and russian uh, respectively even today you see a large number of students just learning in their uh, languages of those countries and there are and many of the major texts have been written uh, especially in social science there is overlap with humanities and of course the major works in mathematics both from the french and the russians were written in their languages and not in english there is a move towards uh, movement towards english as a global language of science but that apart i think um, you know we need to ask this question about the larger politics of english in the country we have seen this earlier debate about uh, english as a way of um, you know social mobility a very important way to balance questions of social justice in india so that also we should factor in this uh, in this debate and also the fact that uh, indian states with many different languages raise another kind of a question for functioning within india itself so what kind of languages do we want to draw upon to work with in india uh, but definitely because um, you know i know that there are people who are interested in teaching for example in canada often tell me that the texts in canada textbooks availability for students in canada is much 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 less than it is in english so definitely there are various uh, ways by which this uh, hierarchy gets reproduced when you don't have it in english um there's a question about the kssp uh, kind of science movements i think they have all done remarkably well very important um interventions although and they may although they may be functioning with a particular view of science um i think there were a lot of um, very important people who were involved in it and i did think it did make some difference at some level there's a question of whether human should humanities courses be added in science education curriculum um if i could speak in capital letters i would say why e s for that and it's an absolutely yes answer to that because i don't as we as i have been arguing in for the last six lectures i don't see how it is possible to understand what not just the nature of science even the doing of science without drawing upon resources from humanities and um, you know and this is something which we will come back to again later uh, there are two questions about related which is one is reasons for science being taught this way and how to make science teachers believe that uh, you know science studies or history philosophy social science is relevant they are both connected as i mentioned as in the last talk one of the reasons why science is being taught this way is that you know science teachers are already too much to teach the core content is so much that they feel the moment they enter into these uh, other kinds of ways of looking at it talking about uh, history philosophy or economics or whatever the kinds of debate which happens in class because takes them to a completely different domain they are not able to finish the syllabus and those kind of questions and then the second point i mean this was the summary i said about this uh, paper by turner and salinger uh, last uh, week where the second uh, i mean the, the, the also the argument that um, they themselves are not trained in it so they don't feel very competent, uh, confident in doing it and so on so there are good reasons why they have not been able to do but then this is a challenge for the phrase a uh, framing of new curriculum and new kinds of textbooks which have to be written now how to make them believe that hps is relevant um one easy answer would be to say educate the scientists who would then tell the teachers and others this is the kind of teaching that should be done um that is not going to happen so we will have to think of uh, you know these kinds of awareness raising Uh, movements in education where you bring in questions where you bring in questions at the basic level of what is knowledge what is what are the characteristics of knowledge that you want you know for example we spoke earlier about whether all knowledge uh, should have an ethical component a uh, component of compassion and so on so maybe if you bring in all of that uh there might be far more uh, traction to this idea of how to make it well but i think this is a open continued conversation so maybe uh we can always uh, you know continue it later uh, there is also a point about deepak kumar historian of science uh and this um, and then the question was have we lost out you know post people like deepak kumar on setting up good history of science programs absolutely yes again and my point here is what have the social scientists been doing knowing that we have been living in a 
dominant science and technological society having been influenced by major uh, european thinkers including uh, from the critical tradition why is it that we have not been able to bring the questions of reflections on science and technology or on the relationship between science society and technology in terms of very good solid science and society programs history of science programs philosophy of science and sociology of science programs you know definitely yes as i said there has been a hijack of these themes within the science community so that others don't talk about it and they can also tell people yes we have a science and society wing within the indian national science academy but or in other places like put them all in iits and icers but we know what they have done to these departments we know the what kind of uh, hps they want in these places in order to support uh, the naive ideas of science which is being done in this area so it is that is a problem i i, I really this is something which have broken my head over for the last 20 plus years they have almost given up um and there's a final question um it's a more difficult question but um, which is about is the fundamental nature of learning itself shadowed by a dominant framing of scientific knowledge with emphasis on things like experimentation and logic as against experience and values and so on um, again from the history of uh, education we know including in the context of not just the uh, higher education but also the school education a constant progression to a certain kinds of ideas of skills of learning skills of uh, disciplinary practices related to science and mathematics and so on and um, uh, they are based upon some tenets of uh, you know experimentation and uh, logic i don't know i mean as i said right from the first session that logic is uh, something which is available to us across disciplines there is nothing about logic which is particularly special to the learning not in the practice of scientific research papers uh, i did make the distinction between where logic enters into scientific knowledge and scientific practice but uh, in terms of our forms of thinking in terms of using deductive inductive abductive systems of thinking which are present in our day to day lives as much as in uh, disciplines like arts and dance and literature and the social sciences and so on so that but but the appropriation of logic as if that is a very central core of scientific thinking is uh, is what is very different so there's a lot of rhetoric functioning here and somewhere down the line um you know educationists must be able to distinguish the rhetoric of what is being claimed on behalf of certain disciplines and what the real state of these disciplines are today we'll see a very good example of another form of rhetoric which is the relationship between science and democracy and that is that uses a, a pointer to looking at how to address this particular question uh, but in particular that the fact that this is against experience and values at the at the expense of experience and values is an extremely important point in fact uh, my work with gopal guru on both our earlier books crack mirror and the everyday social are primarily about this questions of experience and how they uh, relate to questions of social uh, knowledge and how uh, they act as a foundation for developing ideas about the society and so on so i really think the questions about experience and values become extremely uh, important in any model of education that we have to think about in the future okay so again some of these questions are going to overlap with what i'm going to say today and you know uh, there are three big themes in this um, terms in this title obviously i you know we have talked a lot about science so at least there are two other big uh, themes of democracy and marxism and i'm going to be sp- focusing on very specific aspects of them because this is as i said you could do a whole uh, semester course just on science and democracy with you know and of course you can do for years on marxism and so on i'm going to make one one just one strain of thought which is a relationship between these three terms in the context of what we have been speaking about so far in this in this series okay um as i said there are many interesting questions we can always come back to them later on if people are interested i can read some stuff or we can always continue our discussions um in other forums so let me um very briefly set the questions we've been talking about one we've been talking about the influence of science on society in various ways we have talked about a large number of questions related to it including the construction of the social sciences where we discuss this very important question of 
can we how does science relate to the question of society a very important way like we have seen for example in our discussions on knowledge in the social sciences the the structure of social sciences etc is to say well one could model society on science and i want to look at one particular meaning of what it means to say modeling society on science uh, for and i'm going to speak specifically since we're talking about democracy here uh, i want to talk about a specific context of what does it mean to model political action on science so let's say there is a political politics within societies and you are supposed to do certain things and you know the simplest thing in a kind of a democracy that we have is to say we 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 vote and each person uh, votes um, under certain conditions and that's a political action okay of a particular kind of assertion of democratic rights and then you could say what does it mean to model this on science one way to understand this is to say uh, how rational is our voting do we do we vote based on certain forms of rational reasoning okay and there is again a lot which can be said in this i have written a uh, few pieces of public writing on this media writing in my op-eds in the hindu on uh, voting and democracy so please read that because that will take us very far away from this but again the question of what kind of rationalities are involved in such kind of political actions um but i'm going to speak about one particular aspect which brings the question of science and democracy together in which uh, the repeated invocation of you know which which is a representative of the relationship between science and politics and science and governance is a repeated invocation to say that make all policy scientific in other words if you are going to if the government has to decide on let's say allocation of um, resources of money water Uh, or how it is going to respond to air pollution and so on make those policies which do this scientific and as i said the best example of this is being the corona i just can't get over the fact that every day when i'm listening to the news i keep coming keep hearing this words be scientific science 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 so many times i mean even in the question of just wearing masks and this was the the debate as we think to in um, i mean the news things in cnn about this and it was repeatedly science tells us we should wear masks okay that's an interesting point you know whether science should tell you to wear masks or as many commentators have pointed out is it just common sense is there something called common sense by which we act on certain things once you know that there is a particular kind of uh, corona uh, i mean a kind of a pandemic happening how do we respond to people in fact many of the people whom i see near my house who don't wear masks and who think they are you know the heroes and i'm very tempted to stop and say wow you are a superhero i'm seeing one in front of my eyes when everybody else around them is wearing a mask is you know they don't they are not people who don't seem to be non scientific they are probably you know many of them around i'm sure they are all in the it sector and doing some really cutting edge science somewhere so what is it what is it about these policies that are being said what do you expect of these policies when you call them scientific and why would you want to call that if politics is more scientific so what what are the implications of it okay and so the all this are very much important part of the way uh, of the legitimization or the valid validation of this kind of an argument that governance should be scientific policy should be scientific decision making should be scientific and so on and extremely important point okay and i think we should take it Uh, seriously enough in order to see what could it mean why would somebody want to say that and uh, what are the implications of it one way to say that is to say that if policies are more scientific one way is to say well it could be more rational uh, in the larger sense of what we've been talking about i'm not going to enter into whether it's only rationality of quote and quote science which is necessary here uh, more control uh, more control on what you can do with those policies you can't make a policy which is completely chaotic ambiguous don't know what's going to happen so making policies which have uh, create questions of control predictable order all these elements of scientific um, you know so the elements of scientific knowledge for example a scientific process seem to make sense when you re- enter it in when you bring it into the domain of governance and politics they saying okay make your policies this way that's not a problem um but two interesting questions arise one how different is this from bureaucracy and and that's another great topic which we can talk a lot about i won't talk about it here 
because policies are really in the domain of bureaucrats and bureaucrats are i think far more smarter than you know maybe most scientists too and that's a different kind of a breed of thinking which happens in bureaucracy um, i am always reminded when i speak about this about of course about hana arent um, and these questions about uh, the, the you know i won't call it the dangers of bureaucracy but bureaucratic thinking itself uh, but okay let's grant the fact that calling asking that you are making health policy scientific in a very rudimentary sense in a very ideological i just want to call it scientific has certain immediate benefits and is desirable for a society to follow the problem problem is not even this again as of course what i'm saying is something is many people know the major difference is that the variables which are present in political action are far more non linear to use a scientific term dynamic unpredictable so it is not that the idea that scientific policy i mean policies to be scientific in some rudimentary sense is good or not but the question is when there are human subjects at the end of it what does it mean for us to expect policies which are which are in principle desires of more control predictability order and so on and how does that get factored in into the policy so one way is to say uh, you know let, let let's say let's say all scientists say we should wear masks okay great so we all wear and some people don't wear masks because people are not like the natural world if there is a law of gravity which is operating on all objects the stone outside my house and stone outside your house are going to obey it right uh, but the people are not going to obey this so what does it, what then do you do to the policy given the unpredictability of the kind of domain upon which the policy is acting and that's really the fundamental problem about using science and talking about such a what how does science modify in order to understand this kind of a population which is responding in particular ways like i began the the, the question answered the question on pseudo science to how do we how does science respond to the question of vulnerability and death when humans in when confronted with extreme vulnerability suddenly say that look i i don't know what's going to happen i'm going to believe in something which will hopefully save me now now are you going to say let's use a scientific process of reasoning here which is very good great if we can do that but what are the kind of objects to which scientific reasoning is applicable that's the point i mean we've been talking about that repeatedly and when you have a very different domain of objects then what exactly would we mean by this kind of uh, repeated invocation of the word scientific there is a re- very good reason why people are doing this and i want to start with the example which is not my you know i didn't want to do this but i'm going to do it very briefly because you know i have already uh, you know when i wrote about this i had such abusive emails i don't want to get back into that domain at all um but let's look at the example as march for science because part of the march for science really illustrates this question about bringing science into the political society into the uh, uh, larger notions of uh, how people function how it is related to questions of democracy this is a very very key uh, example which has been playing out um, it is being continuing every year as we know um, in april 2017 they give numbers like 1 million people march across the world in over 600 plus places it was a massive um, uh, you know exercise and i w- i'm i'm using this example to show you how the question of science democracy and the left actually play out in the indian context so as i said throughout my eight lectures i'm only interested in how to understand the question of science and society with particular relevance to india particularly because as i was telling you about all these sts uh, uh, books handbooks and stuff these people have been creating uh, is really about a very small segment of the uh, population of the world so Uh, April 27 across the world it was uh, I'm sure you read enough reports about it I'll show you some examples of the uh, what the march for science people were asking in different countries before we come to India okay the march for science people were asked had very genuine questions about complaints about uh, 
Uh, it also happened in the question of the Trump era, uh, a perception that he, he was anti-science, the question of support of money for major big science projects and so on. And I think these are very genuine problems within the community. And you could see this reflected in many of almost all the global march for science. Okay. In Australia, for example, well, the stated aim of the March for Science included universal literacy. We support uh, education to promote broad public knowledge and discussion of scientific work. Okay, please note this. It's extremely important to understand the way in which this, the same group of scientists who are fighting for, uh, you know, science in the public domain, in the, in its, in a way in which science becomes part of social thinking, social practice, okay, a scientificization of the society, if you like. Uh, they were all of them are doing in different countries, but look at what they were asking. So the Australian claims, uh, what they were demanding, universal literacy, broad public knowledge and discussion of scientific work. Open communication, of course, communication of scientific findings and their implications must not be suppressed. Okay, this is, I'm stating exactly from there. Um, stated uh, demands. Informed policy, public policy should be guided by um, peer reviewed evidence and scientific consensus and science for everyone. Okay. So I hope you see this point already as in terms of the kinds of concerns they had and the kinds of ways they thought that scientific uh, bringing in the support for science in society has to function at these levels. Um, discussion of scientific work and, uh, uh, you know, um, implied, uh, peer public policy guided by peer review evidence, scientific consensus, science for everyone and so on. And every country, you know, as I said, have their own uh, things. For example, in Mexico, it was very interesting that part of the fight was against corruption. You know, that was part of the March for Science. It was one of the uh, demands of the March for Science, more funding for students, of course. And in Norway, they bring in their questions about base concern, about science melting, uh, and about ice melting, and so on. But throughout, you can see overall emphasis on facts and evidence. That somehow this seems to be a very major, uh, you know, major idea around which the rhetoric of science is functioning today. Repeatedly, questions of evidence. So you talk to a doctor, they say, ours is an evidence-based science. Okay, when you talk especially about uh, Ayurveda and other uh, homeopathy, Unani, Siddha, etc., they say, as is evidence based science. Okay, um, what exactly is evidence, etc., we have been talking about earlier. One of the other claims which is common again in many of these uh, countries in the larger international mass for science is that uh, more respect for science. There is a very interesting, um, uh, you know, call in many of the places where they felt that especially uh, from particular kind of uh, right wing political movements that there was a constant attack on science. So there was a very genuine problem about certain questions of the science community, which is part of March for Science. Canada um, brought another uh, the dimension that thought is very important to recognize here that science is international and therefore they, they bring a different domain, they a different um, argument to this that uh, science is international and so they were, because they did not have the kind of problems with uh, managing science in Canada, like in the US. So they were actually a kind of a support uh, to the US March for Science. Um, I think the Canadian, both politics and scientific institutions have been very, very progressive. And it is not an accident that some of the best work in STS is done actually in Canada. The number of people who work in STS in Canada, some of the leading members of the history, philosophy, sociology, science, in Canadian institutions. It's not an accident at all because it's a very progressive, um, both in the context of democracy as well as in the context even within science institutions. So among other things they were asking, with the argument they were making is that change in society is possible when scientists come together to defend science and it's critical on us and democracy. Okay, so this is just a very brief, quick look at the, the expectations of the mass for science in all these different countries. Uh, and I'm not doing any selective cut and paste. I'm just presenting it as I saw it in the demands of these things. So, so look at the Indian context. So this is what led to, you know, one of the op-eds I wrote about it and the kind of responses which came and so on. In India, their um, note on this uh, bigger has this particular uh, statement. So I'll just read it very quickly. I'm not going to enter into discussing this. Science in India is facing the danger of being eclipsed by the rising wave of unscientific beliefs and religious bigotry. 
non scientific ideas lacking evidence are being propagated as science by persons in high positions fueling a dot 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 promoting scientific bent of mind would help the social health of our country where incidents of witch hunting honor killing and mob lynching are reported regularly okay and this is a question we've been posing i mean there is absolutely no doubt that we have Uh, you know in a very difficult period of uh, political the growth of the political right and we have to figure out how we are going to deal with it in our country okay there is absolutely no second thoughts about it but i think one of the big problems in trying to um pro- present a society which is of this kind and the use of science for particular kind of social change there is nothing here about what i would see as very important questions of scientific practice scientific accountability and so on okay and um, while all these stuff like obviously mob lynching honor killing witch hunting okay are all terrible but what are these science problems are they with the scientific bent of mind let's assume that whatever you mean by scientific bent of mind facts and evidence this grant them that and say i'm going to get it and come to a conclusion how are these they think how do they think that these kind of thinkings are going to be changed in a society in way people think about the world because of this promoting scientific bent of mind whatever that is and if scientific bent of mind with all the people who are themselves let's say leading the march and promoting all of this uh um, does it that i presume they have all the scientific bent of mind did does it help them stop practicing for example uh, drinking and smoking if the doctors tell us drinking and smoking is bad what is i mean what is it that they want to do so i'm saying this not as a criticism of their all the people took it as a criticism and as i said you know very abusive responses but i I'm, i'm looking at it in a larger sense of what are we supposed to do because we want we don't want any of these in society we don't want religious uh, bigotry we don't want these kind of fissures obviously nobody desires i mean even would even think of supports to things like mob uh, lynching and witch hunting and so on so what is it that we are talking about how does how does this transfer into social action so the other demand specific demands that they ask were about uh, you know three percent you know, of really more money for science which i totally support i think is extremely important they also said more money for education great if they can raise that money it's always good but what kind of education is a important question who has a say in that uh, kind of education and then of course they also say stop propagation of unscientific obscure anti science uh, we don't know what of what of this question about unscientific really is but let's assume that there is some idea we accept that and then a very i think a very problematical claim that the education system should only imparts only ideas that are supported by scientific evidence i have really no clue about what they mean by that um I, you know i think this is this is what i mean by um you know a kind of a very naive way of understanding science and of course enact policies based on evidence based science. so this is evidence based fact evidence is extremely important part of what we mean by science and when you move it from the laboratory from seeing a fact to coming to conclusions about it okay policy in a sense theory based on uh, data and facts or when you look at nature and come to some conclusions about it one can do it in certain ways but how does one do it for complex messy systems and as some people have pointed out and many i'm not very aware of this unit in science many of the questions of science doing science have often been in idealized models i mean even when you look at the earth going around the sun you can you don't you don't start with all the messiness of every little planet in the universe and then try and say how does the earth you go around the sun you know the perturbation from all other you have to calculate all of it in principle and you know for a, to, to to even solve a three body problem was so difficult so you would then take a model of where there is a very a uh, so point like sun a point like earth no problems about the size shape heat nothing you can ignore all of it and then do a scientific modeling and come to some conclusion and that what is astounding is why should this work okay that's a, that's what we talked about in in the earlier things on scientific epistemology very important part of scientific method but how does that then function within 
uh, societies and what are the consequences if you idealize a society and say okay there are 1000 people in my society all of them will wear a mask i'll assume as if they don't have uh, whatever i say they're going to follow the law of society and they're all you know and the whole thing would be like a, a, a ideal model of a of a phenomenon and where does this come from? It comes from a very long history of the very idea of a scientific society. And it's related in a very interesting sense. And, you know, although I didn't want to go too much into it, I just want, I thought it's important to recognize this because um, the idea that of the, of the ideas of notions of scientific society have a very different kind of a historical origin. And it is not an accident that the strong support for the march for science actually came from the left. You know, what, is a, what was interesting was that there were, you know, big names within Indian science who wrote to me after my Hindu op-ed, after I got some of this kind of responses saying, look, they do agree. They know that the context within science is the way, you know, some parts of what I said. Uh, so, you know, they were actually quite supportive of the fact that there was a piece like this about the mass for science. And many of them were not participants in that. There are many of them who are in government institutions of science, including the DRDOs, ISRO, DAE, uh, who are not part of it directly. And there were, of course, some of these, uh, you know, from our elite science institutes who are there. But what was interesting also is the constituents of the other people who are supporting this march for science. And many of them were from the left in various ways, in terms of uh, theater and NGOs and so on. And I think, you know, that's an extremely important constituent, including people who have been very dedicated in bringing uh, science education to the adult, adult education and science education to the society and so on. Again, I, I have great admiration for what they do. But in, in a big mob setting, what happens is that the left, the participants in a so-called, um, um, you know, so-called uh, ideology of the left, they're deeply supportive of this. And I think that is part of their, uh, you know, let us say the preoccupation. And there is a reason for that. You know, there is a long story of a left fascination with science. And part of the reasons of that, I mean, that, that has very deep implications on social practices in every society, including India. The attractions of science included its universality, its uh, capacity to transcend na nations. And therefore, the question of when, when people complain about why communist parties are, you know, look towards Russia or China, etc. And they make snide comments like that. Sometimes and the other political parties make. They're also pointing to the fact there is a pan global sense of what is it, uh, what the left constitutes. It is also um, the fascination with science uh, comes also from the counter to religion. Science is a very important resistance to religious power. Okay, so I want to be very careful in how I phrase it. Uh, religious power in particular, which is extended to religion itself and many times wrongly. And it's also a counter to tradition, which we have seen is very special in the Indian context, uh, repeatedly and not necessarily true in, um, not even in the European countries. It's far more complex engagement there. So there is, there is we can understand why this kind of support for science is uh, being a part of it. But the question again we have to ask is what kind of science is that which is imagined by the left. What is that science they are looking at? What, what is that idea of science? Where is it coming from? What kind of notions of scientific practice and scientific epistemology and scientific method informs their understanding of science when they want science to do certain kinds of social change? Okay, I'm only talking in terms of science and its capacity, a potential tool for social change. And as I said, the, the fact that left fascination with science is so uh, remarkably captured in this long history and a very complex, um, you know, historical, sociological encounter between Marxism and science. And I'm, there are a lot of questions when I'm using the word Marxism here. I'm going to, um, I'll explain very briefly what I'm like. I'm not going to talk about Marxism here. I'm going to talk about one aspect of a response to this question, okay? We can always pick up the questions later for the next session if you think there's of interest, you want to pursue some of this. But um, let me just give you an example of 
one particular question within the idea of Marxism, particularly the idea of scientific socialism. A very important idea, which is for many uh, Marxist scholars, uh, see it as a very important um, practice and goal of uh, Marxism and uh, have written extensively about it. There have been many Marxists who have written against it, etc. But the idea that there is somewhere a question of a very deep notion of science in our understanding of society, um, that, that it plays a very important role in it, is a given to many of the basic canonical accounts of Marxist history. Okay, it's related to the questions of scientific history. It's basically based on the question whether I can have a scientific description of society and of history. Okay, and history, of, as all of you know, for the Marxists is extremely important um, and the very rich ideas of what history is and so on. And, but, uh, the, 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 but the very important principle that there's an evolution of society according to scientific principles is a very important idea which underlies what has been very popularly known, known as scientific socialism. And uh, there are, I'll give you some more details of it to make sense of why, 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 what we are saying. But I'm saying you can see why this whole appropriation of this kind of questions of science within the left comes from uh, a Marxist, a Marxist Leninist tradition, which enters uh, the Indian left and which is uh, appropriated and reproduced repeatedly. But one of the ways in which we need to understand or look at a very meaningful critique rather than a dismissive criticism of the left is to say that uh, one could say that the Indian left has uh, misread the notions of religious society. Uh, it's also happened that many European, um, you know, the scholars, uh, which of course are in, includes um, people like Marx and uh, Weber and others, have uh, and under, you know have their understanding of religious society and the practice of religious society in Asia and Africa are different and there are uh, there is a great space of thinking about religious society in very fertile terms uh, even from uh, 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 let's call it a Marxian perspective if you like uh, there has also been a criticism of the Indian left for choosing the category of class over caste and that has led to various other questions you know within uh, the debates with the Indian left and the response to the Indian left and a misreading or an ideological appropriation. I'm not saying misreading as if they don't know because many of the scientists who are part of the Indian left, I presume, know about the complexity of the science that they do, even if they have not really thought through the meanings of uh, the implications of the uh, history, philosophy and sociology of what they do, but there is an ideological misreading of science. And what is their ideological misreading? One, it retained traditional views of science and scientific temper and of nature. I'm again highlighting those points which I want to uh, respond to, in, to where I'm coming because this is extremely important. As we've been seeing earlier, nature, you have to have a more complex understanding of nature. To assume that science studies nature and nature is given to us externally, available to us, independent of me outside and I'm just studying it, allows science to uh, withdraw the dehumanizing which we spoke about in the first part of the, uh, you know, before I started this talk. So what, how do these very complex ideas of nature, the changing views of nature, not just from, uh, you know, non Marxists, there have been very important Marxian scholars who have also been writing about a major critique of science and, you know, and of nature and so on. How do they, I'm interested in seeing how do they come into this of the left practices in India and how do they come into questions of, you know, things related to March for Science and the use of science for reforming Indian society. Okay, that's all I'm interested in. What is the meaningful understanding of the use of science for reforming Indian society? And part of the, as I said, one of the other uh, misreading of science uh, is in my view and, uh, you know, I may be wrong, but I'm saying this with a lot of sympathy to what they do, is that they're not able to transition from an ideological view of science to political action of science. And in that, we know there have been other movements around the world where science can be very active, very politically active, very dissentful. Uh, it can bring in, uh, you know, very vibrant notions of engagement. But uh, for example, as we have seen in the kind of uh, thing about the March for Science and in the Indian case, 
we are nowhere close to it and i must tell you this also i mean not because it's you know it's it's not about a company it's a fact that you know after i wrote that piece and then there are all these um, things you know response and then as i said uh, i wrote the response in wire and reni wrote and three other people wrote so there is some kind of a debate about it but today if i talk to any of my own good friends who are you know part of the science community even though they may not accept all of the mass for science they will not accept or they do not know how to accept all these reasoned arguments many of us have been putting forth you know it's not about me at all other than me there have been hundreds of people in india who have done you know remarkable kind of responses you know the early work by people like nandi shivishnathan and all are present so it's not that they are they are not there but the incapacity to engage with all of them say something this is what i mean by the ideological view that is you can say you know all my writings on this have been completely as a so public communication i want to communicate i make an argument i use a simple example i use example from the practice of science and explain what it is but absolutely no response it's as if all of us have been saying it and even today when the march for science which happened a few months ago uh, they reproduce the same thing without even engaging with us i'm not saying they should learn from us without even engaging with us that is remarkable and not very surprising to the way science is conducted in india and at least to the indian left all that i want to point out is to say look don't listen to me don't listen to various other people who have written about all this who have tried to persuade you about the you know the impact of science on society listen to marx this is not what marx says about science and whether they really understood because i know if i sit with some of these groups suddenly every three lies they're saying marx said this marx said that so let's look at what marx said about science and i am saying if this is you know not i don't think it's very selective because it's, i'm not selecting something from marx i'm actually drawing upon what in my view is a fantastic book which i really enjoyed reading uh, it's called marxism and scientific socialism by paul thomas um, and uh, scholarly very insightful book where conceptually you can engage with some of these ideas and i just want to clap big i'm just making the point which paul thomas is making about marx's view of science and i thought given our context of how we were talked about uh, science earlier this would be very useful so i'm not going to go in detail through the many different aspects of this book i'm just going to look at one aspect of what uh mark talks about science in order to connect exactly as i said to what we have already spoken about earlier and the first point um, uh, you know paul begins with is to make a distinction between wissenschaft and science and you know many times we will translate it as wissenschaft as science etc but as uh, as uh, paul points out wissenschaft with in german language stands for something much more than science it is rigorous systematic pursuit of knowledge but not reducible always to the mathematical and natural sciences this is exactly the problem which we begin with which is also in my response to the question of pseudo science what is it to mean to think of other rational systems rigorous systems which take into account the complexity of the subject matter okay without reducing it to some simplified idealized forms of reason and there are so whenever people say what is the alternative to scientific reasoning here is a very good example within and you know if you really look at the origin of social science very deeply related to the german ideas related to wissenschaft okay and that's a very different uh, debate altogether but uh, you know that in the origins of social science the cultural differences between the french german and english played a major role in how the discipline evolves and the fact that there are wissenschafts like music wissenschaft literature wissenschaft etc are actually examples of looking at um, you know things like music and literature including the arts in which uh, in in the german tradition always had a very high value um, including as you can see in philosophical um discussions for example heidegger and poetry and so on uh, so there is a distinction we need to make between wissenschaft and science and what paul is arguing is that 
the real term when people talk about science in the context of mass it's actually wissenschaft and it is only in angles that the limited meaning of what we call as science plays out it's angles who is focusing on the the meaning of the restricted meaning of science which we use today and that it is not available in marx and any invocation of the idea of uh, science in marx should actually be along the lines of wissenschaft which is rigorous systematic you can imagine i mean you can i mean understand why this is coming because you have a long uh, tradition of um, philosophy which is already present within the german tradition uh, which is available to all of them so which has questions of rigorous systematic pursuits of knowledge and so on and it so happens that marx was not very enthusiastic about natural science and like engels and, uh, and uh, thomas's point is that um, much of what the marxists call as science and the support of natural science and the influence of scientific socialism comes from engels interpretation of marx and not from marx himself he further makes a point that engels enthusiasm for natural science is not matched by his knowledge and there are there were major critiques of engels understanding of uh, natural science and remember they are writing in the 19th century second half of 19th century post darwin so darwin is uh, some kind of an influence uh, paul uh, thomas uh, paul thomas in his book has a very interesting uh, chapter on marx and darwin also which i won't enter into here uh, uh, but where is this idea which influences the growth of scientific socialism coming from not from marx but from engels idea that the laws of natural world okay transferred transitions into the law of development of human history this is a, uh, is how he describes uh, marx uh, you know as developing the law of development of human history um, uh, when um, uh, you know when when engels description of it and it is not just the fact that the law of development of human history is another kind of a law it is seen as a branch of law of nature so the reduction of society as a part of nature is an extremely interesting idea okay because one could say i'm studying nature and you can remember you can understand that one of the greatest influence of the idea of nature comes from physics post newton uh, i mean there is an earlier story about how laws come into physics but post newton it attains a great a uh, sense of power in the fact that you know the physicists can discover laws of nature now this from the social point of view it's an interesting question to ask just like, as we discussed earlier are humans part of nature are human societies the nest that we build just like ant societies they are part of nature do they function under natural laws if human societies are also seen like ants come your colonies and societies as part of a natural production whatever nature has thought about in terms of human then are we also uh, are human societies also a branch of study of law of nature that's an interesting question but it gets completely reduced into um, a very caricatured form of uh, both science and society and in fact as thomas points out that the only reason in which the 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 excessive emphasis on the question of uh, science the relationship of science to marxism is reinforced in the stalin era through various things including the the invocation of an idea of dialectical materialism which is not present in marx which um, uh, very close to stalin and this propagation through stalin and you know those questions it's, i would i don't want to enter into here the point which is interesting to me on why i am even mentioning marx here is that uh, even though that much of what we hear as the association between science and marxism is related to engels specific appropriation and reinterpretation of marx knowing well as we know now that marx himself was not sympathetic to scientific socialism and never used that term and moreover not just Uh, stopping with that moreover if you really look at what marx what uh, marx meant by science and nature there is something extremely important and uh, something extremely important for our uh, you know um, leftists to consider when they talk about this use of science to reform society science for marx 
was quote the study and this is a quote of thomas the study of the actual life process and activity of the individuals of each epoch he is not talking about science is a study of how an object falls to the ground what is the evolution of the laws of nature which is law of motion for example the study of the actual life process and activity of the individuals of each epoch and you know that given the specificity of materialism which is so central to all varieties of marxism why it is phrased in that particular way but to add to uh, the misreading of uh, marx in the context of science is to also understand that marx dismissed comte's positivistic ideas and um, as thomas recounts it he hears about comte and says who is this uh, french fellow and everybody is talking about and reads it and completely finds it um, you know i mean he dismisses of it because he not only disagrees with comte's very reductive um, minimalist understanding of the view of the signs of a society marx goes to the extent of denying the fact value distinction the fact value distinction is central to science the reason why the question of ethics does not arise in science has a lot to do with the fact value distinction that there is a domain of facts and there is a domain of value and these do not interfere domain of facts are not answerable to domain of uh, questions of value and this is very important because this is not the science which is being propagated as science today which will enter into society and make meaningful changes in society right and to add to the complexity of this to uh, as a break from the kinds of science images of uh, science that we have there is no commitment in marx to universal uh, universal deterministic laws there's a huge debate in philosophy of science about these deterministic laws and uh, whether all science can be um, given all evolution movement towards future are already determined once you know the laws of motion I and mean, one of the great seductive powers of newton's laws is exactly that the fact that with you know um, for example f equal to ma uh, is a evolutionary um, you know evolution of motion of an object and if you know two basic values the you know that is a, if you solve it's a second order differential equation you solve it you need two basic values okay two parameters which you fix you can completely determine the movement of the object forever in time in future very powerful seductive idea of the very idea of uh, laws of motion and so on but not available in marx even in the context of law of evolution of societies because as you know again this question of history is so important all this and i'm sure many of you know about this so now i want to talk about this so uh, thomas wants us that engels positivistic statements about natural science are dreary and uncritical and there's a point which marx makes in capital which i think really captures the way in which the, the march for science or the left movement in science uh, in the naive reading of science have often invoked which is um, when he talks about the um, the weak points of strike materialism of natural science is the materialism that excludes history and its process and which uh, which he finds from the abstract and ideological conceptions of its spokesmen the people who speak for science and if there is something we've been talking about particularly in the science education session was this complete eradication of the ideas of the social and the uh, history for the talking of science and marx in a very important point and i want to reemphasize it and just sort of conclude here very quickly is that um makes a point both about matter and nature which are extremely important uh, to the way we understand uh, uh, science as a social process when he talks about matter uh, as a social rather than a simplistically con uh, conceived natural category and makes the uh, concludes that natural categories are socially mediated the point which we discussed earlier um in the known uh, various contexts and it this raises an extremely important about how these natural categories are formed or to use a, to borrow a term a marxian term how they are produced in the in the sense in which you use production within uh, marxian categories 
this, uh, uh, that becomes extremely important. How will we understand science without it? And therefore, it is not a surprise that Marx, this abstract nature, uh, I, uh, I use the word men here as against all my uh, practice of uh, using gender neutral terms or she instead of he, because this is the language of um, Marx and Engels. Abstract nature without men is not nature. Um, for a Engels, nature is independent of man. That idea is very well finally captured, and this is the last part I want to tell you, because I think it really brings us to a very important way of understanding what the meaning of science is when we want to particularly talk about science in the context of the society. We, you can extend this like early Marxist did, and it is not that uh, Marxism, and I'm talking about scientific socialism, which was quite discredited till it uh, bounced back in some sense. Um, or that there are no Marxian um, critiques of this. I mean, including you can go back to Marcus, um, Adorno, Horkheimer, and others who have been, you know, who have been very worried about the inherent hierarchy and power structures within science. But um, the point is, it is not about that. It is about how uh, this kind of uh, understanding of science already suggests to you how the social studies of science are already present within this uh, way of looking at uh, nature and natural science. Uh, as Thomas points out, the truths of natural science for Marx are themselves dependent on the social purposes and uh, uses all terms which are anathema to the way in which the ideology of science understands science, where it is about nature, where we do not understand um, the social purposes may be given as support structures of society to, uh, to science, but we are really talking about the basic uh, uh, entry of the social into scientific epistemology, which later on feminist epistemology um, and other epistemologies have talked about. But you can see, um, you know, what, how you can think through this question. Therefore, uh, the crucial distinction is thought is that between speculation, contemplation, and abstract reflection, which is a, a constant critique given um, Marx's response to German idealism. And the, the, the crucial distinction is between this kind of abstraction on the one hand and reality, society, concreteness on the other. Science in isolation from society is as speculative as idealism at its worst. And you know, uh, there, there cannot be a greater critique by Marx than to say something like this, that science is as speculative as idealism at its worst. So what we are, uh, what I'm pointing out very quickly is that, that, um, you know, there is something special to the Indian context. And I think the March for Science exemplifies it. And I think the March for Science is important. Okay, so there's no doubt about that. But the naive appropriation of science and given that they have continued the hierarchy of this uh, power within a society that they have for some reason have had post-independence has contributed to you know i think serious problems including in science education whether it is from science education or um, the problems of development in india a very unthinking technological development where we don't have structures which by which you can criticize you can't even ask questions about basic things like biotechnology and other things like this because you know the moment you do it you will be now today in today's term you'll become anti-national because the science community is very close to the nationalist discourse and very close to the powers that they uh, rule this country today so it is impossible for us to be able to do this. And therefore, when you are responding to the question of science, uh, you will have to look at science no longer as an epistemological community, not just as a community is producing knowledge, but you have to necessarily look upon the science community in India as a political community. You respond to them like you respond to uh, RJD and uh, you know BJP Congress etc etc because their functioning is of that kind and their use of uh, signs in order to promote uh, their interests are really functioning like political like uh, as in politics 
okay and a classic example the real fissure of this comes when you come to this discussion about democracy and science and i want to uh, again give you uh, uh, there is a group called the union of concerned scientists you know when science was under attack by a lot of people they the groups of scientists came together and said just like you will have you know very few every uh, time there is a problem in india you'll have some uh, scientists uh, signature campaign i'm sure you've seen enough of that you know some 150 200 scientists will sign something so there is some uh, uh, you know a group called the union of concerned scientists who right this i think it's extremely important to very quickly look at it so i'm just going to uh, not spend too much time on this i just wanted to show you where the context of the politicization of science and the engagement of science within politics uh, functions around the fulcrum of democracy so uh, how do we understand the science's engagement how do you justify science's engagement in society in the context of policy for example they say and this is in the website for decisions to be practical and effective uh, quote i'm just reading the quote they must be grounded in fact and evidence very good if they are to be just and equitable everyone in the community must have a voice in that making the science and democracy are indispensable partners in ensuring the public decision serves the public interest so they are making an argument for why science and democracy is important and they are indispensable partners but they also point out why they are writing about science and democracy as union of concerned scientists is because they find science and democracy are often targeted by those who see or by political power at stake so politicians are targeting science and democracy right these attacks do real harm when they succeed and those of us already carrying the heaviest burdens communities of color and people living in poverty suffer most okay this is in their website and they are actually a respectable community and i am sure i am very happy that they are doing this union of concern scientists but i just thought to show you how uh, rhetoric actually functions just like in the case of the uh, march for science thing in india let's very very quickly look at how this relation between science and democracy is being um repeated day after day in any public debate on science today the stakes by which you want to promote the question of science is working from the from a so called natural affinity between science and democracy so let's try and understand what that could mean first um they make this point about fact and evidence right for all decisions must be grounded in fact and evidence so let's accept that that is fine but in the context i'm talking about all this in the context of democracy okay not just by the question of fact and evidence which we talked about earlier our alternatives even discuss democratically so let's say there are there are four facts there are different evidences so the ayurvedic doctor is saying something and the allopathic doctor is saying something is there a democratic discussion i'm not i'm not talking about acceptance democratic discussion of what is a fact what is an evidence are our facts rejected beforehand before even saying that these are facts which we will consider and then they make the points that so that everyone can have a voice i mean is everyone have a voice when it comes to policy making within science i mean is, is that what it mean to have a scientific way of making policy decisions this is this is neither science nor is it democracy because the question of democracy is not about everyone i will come to it very quickly and then um there is a very quick move towards thus they are uh, indispensable partners in what sense are they indispensable and what is public interest for science which they talk about is ayurveda better for public interest than modern medicine is it that if we have less cars and weapons and many of the technological toys that we have is it better for public interest can we stop doing experiments on biological organisms i mean these are just tip of the kinds of stuff which is happening within the uh, within science of which we don't even know anything about are all these in the calculus of public interest what is the public interest for science and then in the second paragraph when they want to show how science is so closely related and remember that this is a very respectable group and i i think i'm not it's i'm not uh, criticizing them i'm just pointing about how the rhetoric of science function in its sudden association of democracy repeated invocation of democracy everywhere and what does it say they are often targeted science is targeted like democracy since when what history are these people reading when they say you know when they are uh, can you even put the kind of targeting let's say somebody like trump saying i'm not i'm going to cut funding for science to the targeting of democratic movements you know those rich 
historical social movement of democracy in every society of which people have been killed have been jailed for i don't know years what kind of targeting how does suddenly science suddenly get associated with democracy in terms of common target and even where there is a target there have been individual scientists and we know individual scientists have been targeted everywhere we know the famous examples from russia and now china and um, you know nazi germany and so on and few cases in india and stuff like that but they are not you are not targeting a science community when you mean you say science targeted like democracy is where you know you have to recognize that science has always been compensated in societies in governments including the nazi the stalinist russia and china of today in they are always supportive to the government in their attacks on democracy they have produced machines they have produced technologies which can do this uh, attacks on democracy and produce the science and technology community science has always been very close to military and capital interest and for neither for the military or for capitalism democracy is not the aim how is democracy the aim of military and capitalism and there is no science without their association with military and capitalism and we know the examples of how dominant science communities have always supported um you know very very difficult dangerous regimes you know the conservativeness present in indian uh, science community is also one such reflection it is not just about the politics of uh, you know supporting this government or that government it's also about the conservativeness towards social justice inclusion questions and so on and today if there is something which has made democracy so problematical including its questions of surveillance technologies etc they are all produced by what is called science now one way in which a scientist can respond is to say no no you are putting too many things about you know private companies and science institutes it is not we saw that when you are producing that kind of material within science the labor the scientific labor within science which produces you know the modes and the relations of production within science is just stupendously large it's it is very closely connected to power and not to democracy so where in the sudden association with democracy and then i'm very surprised that uh, in their statement they invoke communities of color who are going to get uh, you know who are going to pay a price because they are attacking science what where are these communities within science where are those groups in our own science institutes today in india not communities of color an extension to various dominant communities which are excluded for hundreds of reasons caste gender and so on why where is the sudden i can understand attack on democracy is going to attack all these people communities of color poor marginalized caste groups are all going to suffer if you touch democracy <coughs> but if you touch this thing called science where is it that how is it that you have any way been excluding them all these years where is it that you suddenly get this association that you know because you are attacking us these people are going to pay a price and you know i say i want to use the same rhetoric as them i'm not i'm saying this not because you know i want to be critical about them i'm just saying this because uh, let's look at the kind of rhetoric that they use people in poverty how has really science helped poor people what does it actually mean to say the science is helping poor people since when have come i mean i have been around science institutions for so long and studied science institutions in some sense while being at um, yes i never have i heard any of the scientists in any of their work in any of their lectures any of their own practices talk about alleviating poverty in india what are they doing what is it that they think that they are doing what percentage of science done in india has gone to help the poor where is i'm not saying they should See, this is a, i don't please don't misunderstand me on that i'm saying where is the imagination of the poor present in the everyday practice of science or in the production of science where is the imagination of the poor if we have, we have built very good um, space research etc which we should and they are very Commendable, you know. Although 
lot of dispute about it about the atomic energy program but um, you know where is the, the question of uh, that kind of an effort towards saying we want to get rid of uh, poverty from india if the science community made up of very intelligent and good human people humane people if they wanted to use science to eradicate poverty in india in the kind of money they have the institutional support they have definitely they would have made a dent for it so what is it that this uh, these people are trying to promote and finally of course there is no way we can get out of this and i i don't have time to look at this but please do read this uh, science's loyalty to free market dogma um it is um, written by mackiel when i think it is name so oh, yeah colin mack Kilwain, okay. Um, it's a lovely piece on uh, how much of you know free market uh, capitalism drives science today. How much of it, and how uh, practices of science have gone far away from any questions of open democratic discussion and so on. I, if you think that this is a one-off, and you know it's a respected group of uh, Union of Concerned Scientists, let's look at uh, our. Uh, uh, you know a statement in the scientists on uh, declaration on science and democracy and this statement says okay we must remember that at their root science and democracy share the same values democratic societies are founded on open debate free flow of information mutual respect and the critical role of inquiry and evidence these values are embedded in the declaration of independence etc in the us constitution they are also fundamental to the scientific method so now we can see another kind of an argument on why um science and democracy because they share the same values open debate free flow of information etc so i just give you a quick response to it um like uh, last time we will take uh, questions in another 5 minutes i'll try and conclude this part uh, open debate why there is open debate between scientists and the public because what they are saying is they share Uh, democratic societies are founded on open debate correct how are they how are uh, how is uh, science founded on open debate what kind of an open debate characterizes science open debate is not between scientists and the public and the democracy's basic idea is about the public not about special groups within the society there is open debate between a small group of groups within subgroups that is to put it this way um you could have somebody in uh, uh, you know let's say particle physics debating with each other discussing the critiquing a paper and so on but where is the open debate even between scientists for so where is the debate between particle physics and organic chemists given the specialization where is the possibility of open debate in science today what kind of a model of science are we using where we still think that all the scientists are debating with each other you know this kind of a grand um you know what is it an uh, illusion of scientists walking on the streets debating openly about it sorry they don't understand each other and definitely they are not talking to the public they talk down to the public they don't know how to listen to the public so where what is this question of open debate and today given the intellectual property and secrecy of scientific knowledge which is now increasing as more and more private funding enters into scientific work where is this possibility of open debate which is so important for democracy and every time scientists want to invoke this idea we are open debate open debate and then they talk about critical inquiry great i think it's an extremely important point and we know from education critical inquiry is extremely important but this is the problem with just the same case like the indian march for science critical inquiry scientific attitude good for the poor superstitious people caste ridden religiously driven people but critical inquiry not meant to address questions of science nobody can critically inquire into science it's only scientists and retired scientists or once we scientists who uh, will sit and talk about how go science and society science communication science education everything so critical inquiry is good for everybody except for their own reflection on their practice on their social standing and there is no critical inquiry about science within these people when they are protesting on the march for science when they see their own science institution and what has been done to them when they will not hire a person in the humanities departments 
who they think might ask questions about science and and prefer to hire people who are all yes people to what science is or what a great thing science is cheer leaders is right what is this critical inquiry who is supposed to critical inquiry what if that critical inquiry is so important for democracy how is it really important in the context of scientific practice in india free flow of information very true today you know that it is far more complex than just saying as if information is produced and it's all freely flowing science as we saw is very competitive it's too much at stake get about money and ip in just competition for the first person who publishes a paper competition for prizes we just had to sit in committees to see how the you know people who apply for prizes and get prizes and stuff i mean information is uh, important for them and it's not all free flow what is this thing they are talking about and they, they say this without any reflection on the sociology of publication and the whole industry of publication and the association of publication with uh, private uh, corporate interests and finally mutual respect who have since when a scientist respected ordinary people the whole discourse of the things like math for science is a constant disrespecting of people who don't think like them well, how do we where is the question of democracy in all this coming from lot of it has to do with the problem of the word inquiry they use because it is very singular interpretation of what they mean by inquiry and it is not something which uh, has to be broadened to look at different notions of inquiry i'm going to stop here because i know there's a little bit left um, which i have on um, you know another uh, aspect of democracy and science but maybe i'll continue that on the last uh, session that is day after tomorrow and conclude this part but also um, i was thinking that if we have um, you know questions which have to be answered or anything specific i know see the point is science is a very large topic and as i said you can talk about many different uh, aspects of it uh, my uh, point was to look at uh, you know to to give us certain conceptual tools to be able to engage with this question more critically and meaningfully and not get bullied and say oh you don't know science you are talking about this so how do we empower ourselves in understanding the real nature of scientific practice particularly in the indian context okay and it's something especially in the indian context you know when in spite of what all these people tell you that i have never seen in places in american or european universities where the uh, physics people or chemistry or maths people will be dictating who you will hire in the history or the philosophy department or in the literature or sitting in decision on what kind of humanities should be done they it's not that the physicists there are sitting in great respect of uh, humanities and social sciences but they will not act as if you know they have a right about what it can be done in that uh, department and look at in every of our science institutes which do this um, you know social science humanities departments what they have been doing so uh, there is a very specific question about the indian context so i am focusing on uh, giving us the conceptual way of thinking about it kind of critical thinking uh, and the tools for it not to criticize science and not to criticize scientists at all and it will be very sad if people want to misread this continuously so that they don't have to engage in discussion it is very quick to say oh no no that's all critical of science i'm not going to talk to you it is not that it is because we know science is a great impact on society as we have been seeing including in your own education practices and so on and we need to know just like we respond to religious hegemony to uh, hegemony of the market to hegemony of capital and so on you have to learn how to respond to the hegemony of science which has been uh, very wrongly used in the indian context even compared to all the other countries this does not happen as you saw in the statement of march for science in the practices of indian science community in the uh, repeated uh, denigration of the other disciplines and the impact on our children today forget about all of us children today were going to schools so we have to hold somebody accountable we have to find ways of dialogue dialoguing with them talking to them and finding a middle ground to make sense of this their concerns and our concerns so that is the main point of this so i know there are teams which we may not have covered so please uh, send me 
the mail or this questions and i'll put all of them together in the next session i can conclude you know filling up those uh, small balances what has been left over and responding to particular questions which is of interest to you rather than just talking about something else so i thought that will do you ritesh if that is okay can we go ahead and do that hello ritesh okay i hope i am audible i have just not been talking ritesh, to are you there ah devansh you are there yeah i am here sir i think there is okay. a it uh, dr ritesh Bhai. okay so i'll stop now and uh, maybe if people have questions to type in uh, sure. uh, okay how do i see a chat okay can you open the thing maybe Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah. You are audible now. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So the question, and please feel free to type in your questions, please, and uh, I will. Um, Uh, there is a question here. Whenever sociological questions about science are invoked, their discourse is being relative and anti-science. Okay. Also in Indian society, there is always concern. Yeah. So I did begin with this question about science and pseudo science. Um, definitely, that has come down to teachers of science, and they are have to respond to that question. Uh, I think the question of dealing with such tensions uh, when when whenever you ask questions about uh, sociological questions. um you know it's a, a tough work but you just have to keep telling your story and you keep telling your story and you hope somebody is going to listen to you later down the line or more importantly some students will get influenced and uh, will be able to do more creative science the whole point of doing this as i often keep saying is not to make everybody social science or whatever do philosophy it is to make them better scientists and some of the best scientists in india are exemplars of that they are very broad they are very read in different disciplines you know they are uh, you know sometimes they are protective of science but they are also aware of these different things so this is the tension between science and pseudo science as i said is something we have to find ways to not fight but at least to engage with because people have tried this i have tried this uh even with medicine and i don't understand this you know once i'll give you an example i went to um um you know one allopathic doctor because i was traveling somewhere and I, was, i had a lot of cold or fever or something like that and uh, i told him i don't really like to take your very hard tablets and stuff um what can you say he you know he talked he looked at my things and all and then you know what he said he said i will uh, write a uh, prescription no he said you take this particular medicine which was from himalayas an ayurvedic drug and then he tells me okay he is in one of these big corporate hospitals he saying i want i can't write a prescription for you because i am not supposed to do it and i don't want you know i don't want people to say i'm giving um, you know uh, ayurvedic drug but this is the best for you you go take it so you know this is a tension i mean how do you deal with this question there are millions of people you know i often say uh why do i how do we understand people's trust in these medicines including homeopathy you know there are a lot of questions about this right and once i remember a friend of mine and she was a mother of two young children at that time and they had got fever and everybody was very worried and then she went to one of these uh, non allopathic doctors and you know when i talk about debate about all this we can sit and say what is the epistemology of all this but look if a mother can take two young children suffering from fever with all the concern that she has into to these doctors do you think she is like an irrational person that she thinks oh no how can I, how, how can she be so irrational she is going to homeopathy or ayurveda she is putting her children's life on the line and of course there are cases where you will hear you know something happened etc but how many millions are still engaging with these uh, health practices and what do we understand from them i'm not here to promote these health practices what do we understand about the nature of knowledge and the social practice of knowledge 
and the meaning of health which is what uh, which is uh, which is the, which are the concepts created by culture science cannot develop a concept of health other than that related to the biological material biological flesh body so how to understand this so i don't know if you call it pseudo science uh what can i say it is a problem i don't deny that and perhaps uh, you know or maybe perhaps like everything else it happens in india if we have enough uh, you know westerners keep saying this maybe these guys will all listen to it who knows you know um sorry what is your question yeah you know uh, 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 there's a very interesting discourse that you brought in about uh, uh, how scientists think and talk about science as well yeah the, how the society perceives of science okay. i was just wondering if uh, there is too much of uh, you know also an isolation <coughs> created and reinforced about science historically you know post independence that there is this cre creation which is going to address Sorry. issues in rational ways hmm. and is not uh, you know uh, approachable or accessible by lay people they are yeah done by a set of individuals who have certain credentials and have, uh, are located in certain institutes and the exercise over a period of time is to reinforce that kind of a Uh, belief uh, in an isolated understanding of science because the moment you expose science mm. it 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 is it becomes vulnerable so uh, to avoid this vulnerability there is this monolithic narrative of science that has been created and reinforced over historically yeah could i be correct in saying that or uh, has has science been changing or Uh, has there been a revisioning an element of re-envisioning no okay i i will let, i'll give you the example of canada right i mean um I, the as i said the canadian community has uh, very good sts people um they have very large departments and institutions which have uh, you know philosophy and history of science etc and uh, once when i was visiting a place i had a discussion of the sts uh, very deep discussion of some questions around sts where there are scientists who had actually been part of the sts discussion for a long time who's who who are engaging with sts with all the kinds of scholarship which they have read and discussed with a group of other sts people and these are there was one very famous uh, neurobiologist uh, very well known within the community of biologists uh, who was also part of sitting in all our discussions and talking to us about it the point is that there have been different as i said also that uh, while there are very high um, powered uh, science in, uh, departments in various universities there are also very independent high powered social science humanities departments uh, literature department and so on so and there is no pretension or even thinking that you, these people will be able to you know uh, have some say over those departments i mean when i look at what is happening in our um, you know you could have expert for example okay there's something known so i'm not saying something new you can um, you know if you look at the kind of people whom these uh, iits and ics want to hire there are i mean already we have a serious problem in higher education in india okay in hiring policies and so on <clears throat> but imagine um, i go for let's say for a philosophy job and i'm a new candidate and you know i don't know the world in the sense i'm a fresh phd i'm going for a interview and i'm having some uh, physics and maths guys sitting in my interview saying oh what is philosophy why are you doing philosophy what is the use of philosophy? this is happened i'm telling you of things that happened i'm not you know imagining this what what is philosophy use i'm saying why are you sitting in that uh, thing you know what do you think you think because you can sign it come and tell me what is history and then they'll say you know i read that history in the newspaper what is it that you guys are doing where which society allows that what has happened to our educationists and our social science community and we just say okay right i mean we know that there is politicization in all uh, institutions but the question of uh,
critical enquiry my only question as i said is this if critical enquiry is good and it is good it is necessary for democracy it is necessary for science then why is it that we cannot have critical enquiry towards the practice of science in india without being called as you said you know anti science pseudo science you are left you are right you are whatever why is it and we have allowed that as a public discourse i mean you know and I, at the final the thing i'm not worried too much about it you know we are all adults in the academic world we can survive but really the kind of impact which ordinary people have paid for example due to terrible policies and the use of scientific uh, you know impact like pollutions yeah. and various other issues around it has been disastrous and what do we do about it how do we even talk about it so in other countries yes there has been far more open debate about this definitely i mean in germany and all that uh, because it's a very strong humanities uh, community there is a very strong group where particularly among the uh, including among the marxists and the critical theorists and others so we have to find ways to do that i guess okay lallan says you can ask a direct question Lalan, can you please ask your question? I think he's on mute. Yeah, he's around. You need to unmute yourself. Yeah. Please unmute yourself. Unmute. You have to unmute. You have to press the unmute in your thing. Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Sundar. I'm keenly following you. and uh, i also read uh, review of your book in epw last week oh thank you everyday social yeah yeah so so my actually question is a form of a comment uh, there is a there is a critique within the science is that critique within the science is also happening as you mm. have very rightly pointed out so i'm little bit familiar with the aisal mohali the immediate connection with yeah. aisal mohali right. so i also find the similar kind of resonances when hiring is done in humanities and social sciences program so my simple question is is it whatever is happening to social science is also happening to science and therefore science mm. is not free from uh, the kind of you know hierarchy the kind of undemocratic attitude so my question would be uh, very simple when we are looking at marxism are we also looking at the internal critique within the marxism because mm -hmm. we find plethora of writing you have also hinted that within the marxism they have also critically looked at the science yeah. program the naive science program and how it has a rhetoric so where, where do you place india when this march is very important when we are living in time you know difficult yeah. times Correct. more difficult times even positivism is doing you know good thing you know talking yeah. about positivism is almost like talking about science and talking yeah. about scientific spirit so where yeah. do you place these dilemmas and questions which are actually dilemmas and questions of everyday existence everyday social no very true i totally agree with you and i think the first uh, the answer to the first one is very quick that definitely there is a lot of um, i mean if you talk to scientists who are in some of our best labs is you know there is a lot of unease i mean there is a lot of unhappiness in the way science is administered in india okay and uh, many of Uh, we, we, many of the things we are talking about, they will also tell you how these kinds of uh, hirings are done, etc. I'm not talking about those practices, which are bad institutional practices, which are uh, endemic to many of our organizations, right? I'm talking about disciplinary practices. That is, when uh, you, as a philosopher, you go for a job, then you are ha having to answer biologists and chemists and what they think about how uh, social science should be done. you know i can share this with you i mean i've said it earlier that in a meeting in iis so i can do it uh, you know i was in one of these uh, institutes uh, which i won't name now and they were very keen on uh, so, you know something so i went uh, they were just setting up various things i met one of those persons who was uh, designing and setting up the curriculum etc so it's one of these national one of these isers kind of thing and this is what he said he said we are now starting uh, 
you know we want to have social science and humanities very importantly in our uh, institute but you know social scientists in india have destroyed social science they don't know how to do social science so we want to imagine okay he is a scientist i'm not going to say which field because people may know who it is um because we are uh, we know uh, the fee i mean you know he uh, he, is, he was not from any other social science field and he says the social scientists in india have destroyed the field they don't know how to do social science we want to introduce our students how to do social science and i thought oh that's really odd and you don't know what to tell that guy and then i come to another institution a much bigger institution more famous well known and there they started a humanities program i mean not humanities some classes for their undergrad they really started the undergrad program and the person was running it uh, when i had come to uh, that place once he said uh, oh we have also started the humanities that time i was in manipal and he had heard about what we are trying to do in humanities he said we also started a humanities program for all our teaching for our students but you know we don't want to do it like what all of you people are doing i want to think about humanities in a very different way i mean these are people who haven't even they don't even know the discipline in social sciences and humanities that will not happen within the science field there yeah, is physics physics fellow will at least have some autonomy uh, and some kind of people in his own field uh, who is going to be interviewing those people you know we have lost that kind of bad institutional practices are there but we have had bad disciplinary practices which is what i think is wrong the second point is is very important um, about different uh, thing and the, the, as i said this is not about the indian left i have great sympathy i want i believe left is only hope for india especially given the politics uh, as you say and as you correctly say that's part of the reason why i hesitate to even talk about them and uh, i mean in this sense but i am only talking about it to show the richness of available ways of approaching questions of science and nature within marx himself and so if you want to call it as thomas calls it marxian rather than marxism then you know i think there's something very important to understand about that and um, so i do understand that uh, we are in a state uh, political situation where we have to make sure that there are certain kinds of uh, positions we take I, all i'm asking is this view of the march of science in looking down upon people and their cultural practices is it helpful in a resistance to such governments yeah. i am saying it is not what it has done is just alienated a very large number of people who would otherwise could have been co-opted into the protest schemes because they don't see the respect that they are getting from uh, the people like in north for science or the left where we are able to take them into our fold and respect them as having opinions which may differ, differ radically different from mine but how do i learn in a democratic way to engage with that question rather than tell them repeatedly your blind belief superstition you don't learn anything we will come and tell you how to be that and at the end of it at least if they tell us how to do scientific temper i'll be very happy they only say which hunting etc is wrong very great don't do that right but they don't tell people how they should fight it how do they overcome it they say oh with the scientific temper you will get rid of caste prejudices great please tell me how what is their understanding of caste practices in india that they think that this will immediately liberate people from caste practices when most of the scientists in our best science institutes have not got out of it so this is the question i mean i so it is not a problem with the left i think the if it was not for the left we would be in much worse situation and there is no other way of understanding uh, what is happening with capitalism and digital capitalism without the intervention of the left okay but i am just saying why is the left in wanting to do many more useful things to society why are they wasting their Uh, sense in a naive understanding of science and a borrowed wrong notions of uh, ideologies of science i'm saying they can be far more powerful if they get in because the reason i'm saying this is not because they are right or wrong because people are able to respond to them very easily dismiss them very easily that every time they keep saying this you know i have horrible fights with many of these guys especially all of them technology people okay who are all right wing okay and it's in the moment they read something like this it is just a matter of joke for them because they feel that this doesn't make sense to them they, they feel it's very dismissive i am saying make it difficult for the right to be dismissive 
and the way to do that including the entering of this critical thinking critical temper drawing from literature learning questions of empathy and social belongingness and living together through uh, disciplines such as sociology political science literature philosophy poetry and so on as important we know that the best resistance movements around the country especially in india have come through music so can we have somebody sitting in uh, uh, you know thinking that they somehow get an epistemological prestige just because he is a musician so that's all i am saying and i do recognize of course in indian case there are many different kinds of uh, left things i don't want to uh, reduce that to that okay so i know it's just a limited quick uh, answer to your thing but i hope we see, we know we have to be together in this project but we have to figure out uh, how best to find ways to uh, acknowledge the autonomy of individuals especially the marginalized and the poor as equal to us in terms of their right to have their opinion and then work with it not by name calling or saying that you don't have science thing and i know what it is etc i think that's always been a big problem but uh, you know how scientific communities talk down to the larger lay community rather than talk to each other uh, attempt a democratic conversation thank you i think we have uh, a few interesting questions over here yeah, yeah. i'll take all that well, one quick question because it is addressed to Uh, direct attack on philosophy and let me say that you know so uh, tapasvi says that uh, science community is not doing any tackle poverty as people this could also be extended to many remain philosophy departments correct absolutely i you know i totally agree with you but the difference is it is that science community which is putting up that i'm just using that particular uh, argument about science and democracy uh, and uh, the sorry the union of concerned scientists who are saying that science and democracy are being attacked and the people who are going to suffer are all the poor and the communities of color in that context i said i think indian academics has to answer many 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 troubling questions and i i have absolutely um, uh, not promoting philosophy departments at all <laughs> you know i think they have self destructed much better than i can even say it. it's not about that it's not about a criticism of any other i'm just saying that point came only because that was a claim they make in presenting themselves that's all they say sorry with this yeah no it's it's really um, there's a interesting thing that i notice also in the questions while these questions raise certain conceptual ideas and uh, uh, try to unpack the complexities that are there in indian society mm -hmm. they are also seeking about alternatives alter correct okay you know thinking about how this relationship can be built at different levels of learning yeah so that uh, individuals can engage more coherently more cogently with this kind of uh, tensions that are there yeah so, it is almost like facing a society with its complexities right from a knowledge domain mm -hmm. have some kind of feeds if you could suggest uh no okay i as i said when i finished my science education uh, talk i was trying to say what i think could be mm -hmm. one way to deal with that right i mean that was the last slide i put up mm -hmm. and i can see this again in the context of um, i can also see yasmin has asked us about social uh, sociology of science syllabi itself on what we should be able to do or what how to incorporate that um uh, so yeah i do understand uh, that is a question and the quick answer for me i mean i think yasmin's question is a little more difficult i mean i come to that but uh, there is definitely uh, uh, forms which are available alternate forms of Uh, thinking about these questions so one is about the context of education we spoke about right and that the larger context of meaning of education and how to bring that into our universities and research or iits iisas etc and and where that vision is there but where in their implementation it's been very flawed and maybe we can uh, look at the uh, time where we can really rework that 
and again in the context of uh, social science, uh, science institutes this question of um, you know their inability to understand the social justice concerns including their uh, you know consistent critique on reservation etc in many of our top institutions is very troubling and we have to make them bring them into the fold to be able to talk about it the exclusion of religious communities within uh, science particularly uh, muslims within the indian science institutions is another thing which we need to find ways to talk about right so when i'm saying there are uh, alternatives uh, big, we have certain models of very interesting interdisciplinary programs uh, where for example um, you know there have been of course attempted in various places you create uh, uh, essentially interdisciplinary programs where people faculty of different departments actually engage with each other on big projects which the government supports and uh, it does not mean that uh, physics person will be working on sociology but it comes brings people together where the government funds um, you know a big chunk of money to get them to do that so uh, there are things like that which we can uh, really talk about and i think we need to find a way to engage with what we mean by local and what we mean by let's say country specific questions or region specific asian middle east south asian um etc you know and how are we going to think about that that um, to be is the biggest challenge so one of the ways i did it when i did that manipal thing at least from my experience one of the ways i did it is it's um, you know you can't put too many things so we asked the question why are the texts which i think are so important which i think my student should learn why do i think it is so central why is it canonical so rather than just saying okay this is what everybody does and we are going to do this to me we begin from the question of why does this text matter to the local situatedness by local i don't just mean geographically local because we are all global anyway and responding to various questions around the world but we need to be able to formulate that so one way i thought one could do it is to look at concepts rather than geographies so if you look at concept of justice today typically you would do uh, roles you begin with kant roles and maybe do amartya sen and so on but um, how do we look at the question of justice coming from many different traditions which are not always um, you know textual so how have various articulations of uh, justice been done where have been performances of justice been done and they have to become part of our uh, teaching and uh, so that is definitely a model which will uh, you know speak a uh, lot more to this kind of an effort but i know it's a very incomplete thing which i'm saying uh, but at least i you know and we i think we need to come together in a very meaningful sense to be able to do it you know all of us who think about this or worried about this we should definitely you know come to so like for example the asmin's question about sociology of science yes we have to really go back and look at you know where so i am biased here in a bit okay so let me put my bias also because that's my disciplinary bias also i think philosophy of science matters and i the reason i think philosophy of science matters is not because you know uh, i work in the field i you know now i don't want to have anything to do with academics or any discipline so it doesn't matter to me now but i'm just saying philosophy of science matters because it gives you a conceptual understanding i'm not interested in which philosophers understand it gives you a conceptual understanding of scientific epistemology nature of knowledge in science because unless you tackle the question of science, nature of knowledge in science the special nature of knowledge in science anything you say about feminist epistemology the situatedness all of it people have just not bothered so there is somebody asked a question why people don't listen to this questions of uh, you know uh, history and post philosophy of science etc because they say well yeah yeah whatever it is this is a science which is true which we have been produced so to me it is always um, a, a very surprise for me to find that social science departments education departments don't do a basic course in um, you know philosophy of science or even philosophy for that matter not as philosophers and i think philosophers have to indian thing we have to uh, you know we have contributed to the problem but as um, you know in terms of conceptual clarity can we introduce the hard questions into our social science syllabus the hard tough questions so which means one of the things which is also something i would do in a social science syllabus teach social science students science 
so that it doesn't become a black box. So it's not like somebody they are talking to scientists and says, oh, you know, Newton's law is like that. And then uh, the social scientists are supposed to be, oh, wow, yeah. So what is it to teach them, not as scientists, but the conceptual world of science? How is it that the Newton did it? So next time they talk to a scientist, scientists can't get away with saying something which they don't know anything about, about what a scientist said. That's one possible way, but of course this needs a lot more. Okay, so is that okay, um, Ritesh, that I pick up all these questions and tie it up um, also um, for the last talk? Um, and uh, and uh, would it be okay for me to ask uh, a little bit more? Yeah, yeah sure, because I am no hurry, so please ask. Yeah. If you no, I, I just wanted to yeah. uh, understand if we can, uh, in the last session, uh, yeah. have uh, questions and discussions but also have a little bit of uh, the imagination of uh, how history and philosophy could enter into the school curriculum. Okay, uh, sure. Teaching yeah. and learning of, uh, at various levels, so that yeah. uh, I, I'm quite sure that you have certain experiences from barefoot philosophers. Yeah. And so uh, engaging with the ICERs, NICERs, and also secondary schools, where some opportunities yeah. are open. So, tweaking that kind of a uh, niche area would be of uh, particular interest to education. Okay, sure. We'll look at some specific ways of addressing that question. So, do you think we should uh, close this session for the day? And uh, sure, as you said, I am fine. But yeah, maybe it's already we are past our. Uh, yeah, we have already <clears throat> seven thirty. So maybe we'll uh, take this to a closure. And okay. we'll meet for the last session on okay. Thursday. Is okay. That... All right. Thank, Thank you, all. you once again. It has been yeah. really an interesting <laughs> session. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's been a great group of all of you here. So it's been more inspiring. You can send me all your uh, what do they do in all this Twitter, etc. What do they call it? I think I, since I don't use any of that, I don't know. But it's a kind of a, any of your abuse you can direct to me as email and questions. <laughs> you know, and which I can answer back. Uh, maybe on Thursday. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. And thank you to the audience for being, you know, raising wonderful questions. Yeah. Thank you. Please. Thank you.